I woke up again and heard mom and dad arguing. Mom told dad that he was fucking up her life with all his playing around and he's walking out on us and his moods and she was fed up, just fed up. And he answered back that it was hard for him too. He felt stifled and stuck in a rut. His time was running out and he never succeeded in getting anything done. Then she said that if he complained less over his wasted time, he wouldn't waste so much time. And he asked her not to be nasty. After that, they kept quiet. Suddenly, he said that he doesn't know what is happening to him. For months now, he hadn't been able to write. And that's true. And you can't blame him for not trying. Sometimes when I go to sleep, he's sitting in front of the computer. And when I wake up in the middle of the night, he's still there. And in the morning, his head is resting on the keyboard. He must have fallen asleep in the middle of trying to write something. But the screen is empty or the letter T written a million times. And once he filled 10 pages with SOS, SOS. But I couldn't figure out who he was transmitting it to. And I couldn't ask him because then he would have found out that I go into his hard disk and read his private documents, which he doesn't even let mom read. Mom interrupted him and screamed, Karamba, is it my fault too? Is it my fault that you can't write? And Karamba is because she uses words in Spanish when she's upset because she's from Argentina. And those are the words that come into her mind first when she's not thinking. Everything fell on her shoulders, she told him. And she felt alone all the time and constantly tested because she never knew when the next time would be that he suddenly disappears. And on this, I agree with her. Because Dad's already done a disappearing trick on us a few times before. And then I peeked through the crack in the door. Up to now, I'd only been recording. And I saw her trying to light a cigarette. But her hands were shaking and she only managed it with the fourth or fifth match. And Dad said to her, Alma, that's her name, which means soul in Spanish. Isn't it a shame? You've just finished that treatment to quit smoking. And she said, Mierda, which means shit in Spanish. Suddenly you are so concerned? And she flung her cup to the floor, sat down and began to cry very quietly. And dad stood there watching her. And then he bent down and began picking up the broken china. And I whispered, you can hear it on the tape. Oh, please, God, just don't let them separate again. The first time Dad left home, he lived with some slut from the theater. That's what Amalia told Mom when Mom investigated her about Yael. And Amalia, who's Mom's best friend and Dad's worst enemy, told Mom a lot of details about Dad and Yael. And however many details she told Mom, it wasn't enough for her, and she went on grilling her as if she was trying to discover some secret that would help her understand of how. How could this ever happen to me? And Amalia explained what's so complicated about this. That's the way 40-year-old men behave when they sense the beginning of the end. <laughs> Whenever they see a pair of young tits, it gives them a hard-on. And Yael's tits are something to write home about. They are fresh and supple and firm because she was, a, she was at least 12 years younger than Amalia and Mom. And then Amalia sighed because women younger than her always made her feel sad. But then she immediately added with a smile that... Darling, listen to me. The years will soon crush your L's heads too, I'm, I'm telling, telling you. you. And, and a bosom that size, size would have a long way to drop to. too. Believe you me, <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. about. Alma, I'm sweetie, you don't have anything to worry about. about because that little tramp would chuck him out in the end like she chucked them all out. She chucks them all out, sweetie, don't you get it? And he would come crawling back. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Got it, sweetie. <laughs> And mom promised her that even if he came crawling on his belly, she would never take him back again. But a couple of weeks later, when he returned, she forgot all about it and was willing to take him back only if they would deal with the problem seriously. And dad asked her if dealing seriously meant going to therapy. And mom said yes. And she accused him of Naamah's asthma attacks getting worse and me getting fat and recording all day instead of playing with other children. And so we began our therapy at the Adler Institute. You, this big man is, <laughs> is you. My sister Nama. And why am I so big? Because we are all afraid of you. Oh. And opposite to you is Mom. Shaul is a little smaller, and little Yotam is holding hands with Dad. And uh, who's on the side here? Who's sitting on the side? Oh, that's me, Nama. 
I'm, I'm sitting on the floor, drawing that picture. Oh, nice. <laughs> and every Tuesday at half past six, everybody began dropping things. Because therapy isn't a good place to come late to. Which we learned after we came late for the second time, and the therapist explained that it isn't acceptable to come late here. And if you have started out this adventure, you have to take full responsibility. We all sat with our heads hanging, and when Dad mumbled something about the traffic, the therapist said, yes, it's impossible what is going on with the traffic, but you have to take it into consideration. So Mom promised that it wouldn't happen again. And it really didn't happen again, because we began arriving an hour earlier, and Mom would rush us all the time. And from that rush, I learned that there is a connection between air and time. A, both are similar because they are transparent, and B, you don't feel them when they are available, but when they are not, you feel them and how. Because when there is no air, you suffocate, and when there is no time, you start to rush, but when you rush to gain lost time, you start to pant, and in the end, you may arrive on time, but with no air. There is no such thing as abnormal. Everything is normal. Yeah. But at the age of five, children are quite accurate in their portrayal of the human face. Yeah. And perhaps we can learn something from the fact that Naama drew everybody with no mouths. And on the other hand, see what huge eyes everybody has. Asaf, what's your opinion? In the end, Dad got fed up with the whole thing, stopped coming, and promised mom that he would take care personally of my problems at school and my excess weight. And he really did begin helping me with my homework. But his patience soon ran out, and he would get mad at me for not holding the pencil properly. And it was even worse when he took me jogging. And I would get a terrible pain in my side, but I knew I mustn't say anything, because then we, he would be very disappointed. And he took me to the pool, too. Yeah, and, and when I complained that I was cold and my eyes were stinging and I wanted to get out, he would try to convince me nicely. And when I wasn't convinced, he might suddenly lose his temper and yell at me that I was a sissy and too soft on myself. And once, when we weighed ourselves in the showers and saw that I hadn't lost a single gram either but the opposite, I'd put on weight, he looked at me and said, look at yourself, aren't you ashamed? And I didn't answer and all I wanted was to get dressed quickly and hide my fat. But he went on, no, you're not ashamed. But let me tell you something, I'm beginning to feel ashamed. Look what you look like, like a mountain of fat. And then he dragged me by force to the mirror and stood me in front of it and yelled again. Have you looked at yourself lately? Do you have an answer for me? And I closed my eyes as tight as I could and he told me to open them. So I closed them even tighter because even without a mirror I know exactly what I look like. And then he tried to open my eyes with his fingers and said to me, Naturally you close them. You disgust yourself. But what are we supposed to do? walk around with our eyes closed all day. And then he pushed me aside and began to dry himself. And when he noticed I'd opened my eyes, he asked me, what's so difficult about losing a few lousy kilos? And worse than what he said was the way he looked at me. So I moved away and took my tape recorder and went to record a conversation between two people sitting on the other side of the lockers because I couldn't bear looking at him and listening to him anymore. And I had one of them trying to persuade the other one to buy his subscription to the Kassabra Cultural Center from him. And the second one asked him, what's for? And the, and the first one explained that it's worth your while because it's a whole culture package. So the second one asked, what's a culture package? And the first one explained that the culture package included one play by Habima and one by the Haifa Municipal Theater and a concert by the Rishon Lezion Orchestra and a Bacheva dance performance and a children's play. So the second one said, I haven't got any children. And the first one explained, that's what's so good about the package. <laughs> that you can choose something else instead of the children's play. So the second one asked, well, if it's so good, why do you want to sell it? And the first one thought a lot about this question. And exactly when he was about to answer it, Dad turned up and ordered me to stop recording. And I asked why. So he said, why? Because I told you so. And his look became even more frightening, as if he was disgusted by me. And then he came closer and tried to take the tape from me by force, but I didn't let him. This tape has been with me for years. I take it everywhere. And Dad himself gave it to me once when I was sick. Dad used to sit with me most of the time then because Mom was busy supporting us. And he would listen to the stories I told myself and hug me tight with his muscular arms. 
and keep saying over and over again, my little boy, you are really something. Where do you get all those wonderful stories from? <laughs> and then, then he also brought me this tape recorder. My first Sony, which is what was written on the box and suggested that I should record all the stories I told myself so that all those wonderful things wouldn't be lost and that I record all the interesting things I had from other people as well. And I told him that everything interests me, that record everything. He smiled his son's smile, which is how mom described it. And it was for the sake of this smile that she had married him. I know it because that's what she once answered Shaul when he asked her, why did you marry him? And Shaul said that people didn't get married because of a smile. And mom said to him, oh, you'd be surprised. And Shaul said, I am surprised. You should have checked other things about him as well. And then we wouldn't be stuck alone like this now. Because it was during one of his disappearances. And I told Shaul that if mom hadn't married dad, we wouldn't have been born at all. So he told me to shut up. <laughs> Nobody asked you. And anyway, you are a traitor. The last words he said, but because when we were coming out of school and dad was waiting at the gate because he wanted to explain where he had gone, Shaul wouldn't listen to him. He took my hand and began pulling me quickly. And dad followed us and kept saying, Shaul, stop a minute, I just want to explain. And then I tripped on a stone because my, my head was turned back all the time and I cut my knee. And dad asked me if I was all right, but he was afraid to come closer because Shaul immediately began to help me up and told dad that he had better go away and leave us alone, otherwise he'd call a cop. But dad saw the blood on my knee, so he took a step closer, and then Shaul picked up a stone and told him, one more step, I'll throw the stone at you. And dad said, look at your tummy, his knee is bleeding. And Shaul answered, it's nothing. And dad replied, well, I want to see if it's nothing. And he took a step closer, and then Shaul raised his hand with the stone and whispered, one more step, I'm warning you. And dad stopped. And then Shaul told me, get up, stop putting on an act. And I got up and Shaul took my school bag and began pulling me even faster this time. And now I was limping too. And because I kept looking at dad who remained there standing all by himself, I fell again. And Shaul began yelling at me for falling all the time. And I began to scream, leave me alone! Leave me alone! And I threw sand in his eyes, got up and ran to dad at my top speed, which isn't anything to write home about. And he was waiting for me with his arms opened and hugged me tight. And afterwards he said... Let's see the damage. So I sat down, and he took out a handkerchief and began cleaning the cut and smiled. And now in the locker room at the pool, I really missed that smile when he stood next to me and tried to take the tape from me by force. But he didn't smile. He just kept saying... Give me that tape recorder. Give it to me now. And I don't answer him, and all you can hear is his breathing and my breathing, and the two people who were talking about the culture package stopped and stared at us. And I was ashamed for him for behaving like this in a public place. So in the end, I gave him the tape recorder, and he took it and told me he wasn't giving it back until I lost five kilos. And then I burst into tears because I couldn't stand it anymore. And he yelled at me, What is it with you on those recordings, you crybaby? What's the use to spend your life recording? Start living. And I said, But you told me to record. So I told you. I told you I <laughs> This is how my first Sony broke. And to this day, I don't know if the other man bought the culture package. And if he did, how did the first one succeed in persuading him? That same night, he woke me up again. 
and gave me a new tape recorder, much more sophisticated, with two channels. And I asked him, Dad, where did you buy it at night? And he told me he knew someone at the airport who let him into the duty free. And I asked, and where did you have the money from? And he said that he robbed a bank and smiled. And I smiled back. And then he pulled me towards him, hugged me tight, and begged forgiveness from every gram and gram in my body. The surplus grams, too. And he apologized again, explaining that he couldn't control himself, which he repeated a few times, I can't control myself. And he said that he wants me to know that he wasn't angry with me, but with himself, but it always came out against the wrong people. And I stroked him and said, never mind, Daddy, never mind. And in the end, we fell asleep together. In the morning, I woke up before him, but I didn't move so that he wouldn't wake up and get out of bed because it was so good to feel him close to me. And I only put out my hand to the new tape recorder he'd bought me, and I switched it on. And that's the first recording I have from it. Dad's breathing, and he's stretching, and the question he asked, is it morning already? <laughs> and his son smiled when he saw me. Uh, and all the time the pleasant murmurs of mom, now and Shaul from the living room talking about unimportant little things, which are the things from which happiness is made, like mom says. And when people talk about them, you can tell at once that nobody died, nobody is sick, and no wars broken out. <laughs> and what my tape didn't record was the sound of my heart praying that nothing would move, that nothing, nothing would change. But things do change. And a couple of weeks later, Dad mortgaged our house and all the furniture in order to produce some film he deeply believed in. And one, uh, one day, two big guys from the bailiff's office, who were also identical twins, appeared at our house with a little policeman who came to escort them. And we all sat on the sofa in despair while they walked around deciding what to take. And after they had gone, Dad asked Mom why she had to leave a good position in favor of a dubious independent career. So mom got really mad and reminded him that he hasn't been successful with any play for years now and she is fed up waiting for his big breakthrough and she wants him to know that the passing time he's moaning about passes not only for him, but for her too. And what will happen now, Asi? What will happen with the computer and the apartment and all the things they've taken? It's impossible to go on like this anymore. Late night. I told Shaul I had an idea how to make money. I reminded him of the neighbor opposite us who comes home on Tuesdays and beats his wife regularly. And Shaul asked, how can we make money from this? And I explained that we can sell tickets to kids from school. <laughs> and he was excited by the idea and worked out that if we manage to sell 30 tickets every Tuesday for five shekels a ticket, we can make 600 shekels a month, which is a fortune. And I can recall the meetings and interview members of the audience after the show, which will increase our sales for the following weeks. And the next day, she will spread the news and hang up posters. And on the first Tuesday, 24 children turned up. And it was quite a squeeze to fit them all into the kitchen balcony from which you can see the neighbor's apartment. And some of them complained about the trash. So she will shut them up and told them that anyone who wants to leave can leave. But anyone remaining should keep quiet. Because if the neighbor catches us, he'll stop the show immediately. Our neighbor came home, and as usual, he was in a bad mood. He immediately started complaining about the food his wife had cooked for him. At first, she didn't answer, which made him even madder. Suddenly, he throws his plate at her. She retreats to a corner next to the kitchen sink. She never learns from experience, surely. She always walks into the same trap. Then he comes up to her, slaps her, and she, she begins running away from him all over the apartment, shuts herself in the bathroom, and we can only see her head. Because builders in Israel build tiny windows in bathrooms. <laughs> At this point, Imbal starts to argue with Shaul, telling him that she wants her money back. Oh, oh and I tell her, you are spoiling the recording, Imbal. Because at that point, the woman there starts to scream, Help! Help! He wants to kill me! He's killing me! And stupid Nibal overlaps, and you hear her instead of the woman. 
And I explained to her that even in the movies in Baal, the murderer is sometimes on the other side of the door and you can't see him. But in Baal keeps on nagging until Shaul gives her her money back and tells her to turn her back and not to look. And cover your ears as well because the tickets also <laughs> include the sound. <laughs> and Adaf suggests that maybe we should call the police. Oh, oh, and I tell him that every week she is screaming that he's going to kill her. But in the end, he doesn't kill her. And they come down and fuck standing up in the toilet. <laughs> And Iqbal asks me if I'm sure. And when I say yes, she turns to Shaul and asks him, can I buy my ticket back? And Shaul tells her, now it will cost you double. <sighs> anyway, that night, we gave mom and dad 145 shekels in a bag. And they were really excited. And dad suggested going out to celebrate at a good restaurant. But mom said, you have got a letter from your mother. And she gave it to him which made Dad very nervous because letters were Grandma's way of talking to him about things he didn't like talking about in person. <laughs> and in her letter, Grandma reminded him that he was already 39 and has three children and she and Papa aren't so young anymore and they don't have much to leave their children and grandchildren and the family is a sacred responsibility, Asi. And it is hard for her to hear from Shaul that because of a shortage of money, we have stopped buying health food schnitzels, which are the only schnitzels Shaul is willing to eat because lately he had become a vegetarian. And in the Survivors Association, there are survivors who are searching desperately for someone who can write up their memoirs for them in a professional way because we are getting fewer. And even those who have kept silent understand that we can't allow those terrible memories to die with us. So here you have an opportunity which combines spirit and matter. Important work with a small income attached to it, and in your position, every shekel counts. And next Sunday, next Sunday, Mr. Halperin would come to see you to discuss the conditions and method of writing his memoirs. At that point, the bell rang, and Shaul went to open the door, came back to the kitchen and said that there was an old man named Halperin there, and he was looking for dead. And dead raised his head from the letter and said, she has done it to me again. <laughs> you see this picture? This is Mama. And next to her, Papa. And my big brother, Elisha, he fought in the First World War and lost his leg, unfortunately. And this is mortal. <laughs> and what a genius. What a genius. Not like people said about anyone who once studied in a yeshiva and afterwards perished that he was a genius. But a real, real genius. And so that became a ghostwriter, which is someone who writes other people's stories for them and signs their names. And each of these survivors had his own way of telling the story. There was Sonia Kravis of Grodna, who lived for two years in a pit in a pigsty with good Gentiles, and before important things she would say to Dad, pay attention, or write it in my words, or let me emphasize. For example, she said, inside it, inside our pit, in the pigsty, on the banks of the river Nimen, childhood passes by. The clothes we brought with us are too small. The shoes don't fit. Henya, who was a year old when we came down, learned to speak. I got my period. Emphasize. Five souls, a pit two, two meters, meters by, by two, two meters. meters. 24 hours a day, two years. Did you write that? Did you write that? Write down a summary or a kind of abstract. A pit with a Jewish family in the middle of history. A grave of living people in the middle of death kingdom. The last sentence frightens me. Jews in the camp suffered a lot more than us, yet everything was upside 
down. After Sonia had left, Dad listened to her story once again. Everything was upside down. Did you write that? And here he switched off the tape, sat there thinking and looked very sad. Suddenly he called me because he knew I was hiding on the balcony under the window and asked me to come into the room. And I asked, for the window or round by the door? And he said, whatever you like. So I came round by the, do by the door because I didn't want to add the crime of climbing through the window to the scene of eavesdropping on Dad's meeting. And I entered the room and asked, me, asked him if he was angry with me. And he told me to get closer, which I did. And he held out both his hands to me, pulled me towards him, hugging me tight. And to mom he said, I cannot deal with those Holocaust stories anymore. And she answered, you have no choice, Asi. And if it weren't for her saying, you have no other choice, Asi, and Seven Souls Noah, the survivor who had paid my dad a lot of money for his story, my dad would have definitely quit Holocaust stories. Working on Noah's book was very difficult because Dad had to travel a lot and meet with people from Noah's past. And we all thought that when he's away, he's busy only with the book. Until one day the phone rang and it was Noah who was looking for Dad and Mom asked, isn't he with you in Poland? And Seven Souls Noah, who never got confused, mumbled something which Mom said wasn't the most successful lie he ever told. And I went to pick up the other phone and was on time to hear, to hear Noah say, you must forgive him. He's an artist. And he's going through a very difficult period with my story about Treblinka, which is beginning to oppress him like he does the survivors. And you should know that he loves you very much. Even if he sometimes does go to lay his eggs in other nests. <laughs> and mom said that it doesn't come as any news to me, Noah. The only problem is that he's, so, that he's so busy laying eggs in other women's nests that none are left for his own nest. And I'm not talking about screwing. He simply isn't here anymore. He's either traveling or wandering around or in that little studio you rented for him so he would have a quiet place to work. And Treblinka has got nothing to do with it, Noah. Because if it weren't Treblinka, he would find something else to take him over and make him depressed. And the truth is, the truth is, is that I'm beginning to lose patience with him. And she hung the phone and grew very pale. Because only a few days before, after they had both taken the AIDS test and the answer was negative, Dad promised her that he had finished playing around and he wants to concentrate on her, his work and the children. And he understands better than ever that love includes a dimension of choice. And he knows exactly what his choice is. A couple of days later, he suddenly appeared one evening with a suitcase. The suitcase he had supposedly taken on his trip to Poland with Noah. And mom didn't even check with him where he had been, although he wanted to explain and said that it wasn't what she was thinking. She simply asked him to take his stuff out of the house. And dad said that he would drop in when he had the chance to collect his computers and a few books. And mom said, there is no point in waiting, Asi. Just take them now. I want a clean breakup with no excuses for coming back. And dad said that he prefers taking the things when the children aren't at home. And mom said, you cannot soften reality by hiding it, Asi, which is more or less what you have been doing all your life. And the children know a lot more than you think. At this point, he became suspicious and asked her, what have you been telling them about me? And she said, me? <laughs> I don't have to tell them anything. Our story tells itself. Dad came quietly into our room went down on his knees next to my bed, and when he saw that I was still awake, he asked me, did you record everything? And I said, yes, I did, but I can delete it if you want. And he smiled and said, no way. No way, you don't delete the truth, even if it hurts. And then he asked me, what was I going to do with the recording? But his voice broke on the word recording, and he burst into tears. He didn't finish the question. He laid his head on my blanket and asked a couple of times, 
What am I doing? What am I doing? What the hell am I doing? Hello, you've reached Alma and Asaf. You may leave a message after the beep. When Dad left home, I would call every day from the public phone at school to check that Mom hadn't changed the message on the answering machine. And hearing Dad's voice would calm me down a little. But one day, when we came home from school, Shaul put his key into the lock and he didn't turn, so we rang the bell and Mom opened the door, immediately gave us new keys, explained that she had changed the lock and didn't answer. How would Dad get in if he suddenly decided to come home late at night? Like the night before last when he came to collect some materials about Roblinka. At first we didn't hear him, but then he switched on the answering machine and the messages woke us all up except for Nama. And mom came out of her bedroom in her panties and without even saying hello she asked, Asi, what are you doing here? And he waved the stuff he had taken and said that he needed it urgently. So she reminded him, I've asked you to coordinate visits with me in advance. And he said that these weren't visits because it was his house too. And because it was late, he didn't want to wake us all up. And there was no reason for such a fuss because he hadn't stolen anything. Just taken a couple of CDs, several books, that's all. And by the way, who is Leonid? And mom said, it's none of your business. Who said you can switch on the answering machine? You don't live here anymore. That smiled his life with his smile, came up to her and began stroking her gently. And although she wanted to throw him out, she didn't move and didn't say anything. And then he pulled her and began kissing her all over her face, even her mouth. And even when he pushed his hand into her panties, she melted, hugged him back and cried, Asi! But suddenly something came over her and she began punching him on the face and chest, yelling, Go, go away, get out of here! And she ran to the door and opened it. And Dad was so scared that he even forgot his CD! Which he came so urgently to collect in the first place. So we stood there with our new kids and saw Amalia and Maya, mom's friend, standing in, the, in an ocean of boxes in the living room. And she would ask, what is going on here? And mom explained that they were tidying up. And what they were doing was going through our enormous library book by book and asking about each book whether it was mom's or dad's. If mom answered mine, they dusted it thoroughly and put it back on the shelf. But if the answer was his, they put it into one of the boxes some of which were already packed with Dad's computer, his clothes, his books, his, all his belongings. And that was the first proof that Dad's career with Mom was over. And the second proof came after supper, when we went to bed. Hello, Asaf Lazar doesn't live here anymore. You may leave messages for Alma only after the beep. Thank you. Michal. Michal was the first slut that Dad introduced us to. And when he brought her over, we went to the Dead Sea. And that night, Michal the slut took me like she had promised to the observation point where you could hear the jackals and foxes. And I recorded them and kept the recording on the shelf with sounds from nature. With a second recording from that trip, I had a problem. Didn't know on which shelf to put it on. Dad crept into Michal's sleeping bag after he thought we were all asleep. And she said, Asaf, your children. And he said they are sleeping. And she asked, and what if one of them wakes up? And he said that they sleep like dormice, which means very deeply like hibernating animals in the winter. And she said, nevertheless, I don't think we should. And then she stops and makes some kind of a moaning sound and goes on whispering, you have no idea what you are doing to me. And he says that up to now it was nothing, only the overture. 
And after a minute of silence, she lets out another cry, and that tells her that in tonight's concert, Fortissimo is out. And she giggles and whispers back, you know I can't help it. And that tells her, bite your lips. And then it gets quiet outside, and inside my head someone screams, horror, horror, horror. And the wicker voice shouts, cheater, cheater. And outside there is another little sigh from her, and that tells her that to be on the safe side, you had better check and see if your thumbs tape is off. Because with that child you can never tell. And then you hear the sound of the zipper of the sleeping bag opening, and I immediately switch off the tape. And then Dad loomed over me, and he was huge and completely naked, and his dick stuck out between his legs like some kind of sword. And I closed my eyes and felt like vomiting, but I held it in. And I felt him bending over and examining the tape. And then he whispered, Your time. Your time. Because he wanted to make sure that I was really sleeping. And then he came closer and gave me the kiss with the smell of hair scent on it. And I prayed, oh, please, God, just don't let me vomit and make him understand that I know all about his shame and disgrace. And then he went to Shaul and Naama, checked up on them too returned to the sleeping bag and told Michal that she could give herself to him at full volume. But I kept on closing my eyes and pushing my fingers into my ears so as not to hear the sounds they made. And I yearned that the sun would come up and wipe out this nightmare. And when I woke up in the, mid in the morning, the sun rose over the mountains. Dad and Michal were bathed and fresh, made us hot chocolate on the gas burner, and I was pretty sure that everything I'd had in the night was really a bad dream. Until I noticed the bite wound on Michal's lips. Dad became very busy with Noah and Treblinka, and he had to work like crazy at night too. And all of us, in other words, Michal and us kids who had agreed to stay overnight with her alone for the first time, had been requested not to call him except in emergencies because he had to stick to his schedule. And he is proud that he has such grown-up children who show consideration for their father. He hurried off and left. And later on, when we sat down to eat supper, Naama began to cough, and it soon changed into gasping. And Shaul, who immediately realized that it is one of her asthma attacks, set her on his knees, calmed down Michal, who was beginning to panic, and asked her to bring the bag that Dad had packed for us with everything we would need for the weekend. And he asked me to take out Naamah's emergency kit with the inhaler and the ventolin. And I saw right away that Dad must have forgotten to pack it, Shauli. And Shaul said, it's impossible. And he went to the bag and began throwing everything out until there was nothing left. And then he said, fuck. And he asked Michal to stop calling all the numbers Dad had left for her and to call us a cab. And as soon as we got home, Shaul grabbed Nama's spare kit and prepared it quickly. And when he saw that Nama was feeling better, he turned to Michal, who had become so used to Nama's whistling breaths that the sudden silence alarmed her even more. And she asked Shaul a couple of times if he thought everything was okay now. And look, her chest is hardly moving. Perhaps she's not breathing. Maybe we should call an ambulance. And do you have any idea where your father might be? Nobody answered. And Shaul switched MTV on. And he told Michal that apparently she wasn't the only pebble on the beach. And Michal said it's impossible. And Shaul explained, just as you had been dad's bit on the side when he was with mom, he has another bit on the side now that he's with you. And there is no reason in the world, Michal, that a man's character should change just because he had changed his woman which was an exact quote of what Amalia once said to mom. And hearing this, Michal was speechless. And after a few moments, she fell asleep. And we followed. Mom arrived home at about 3 o'clock in the morning with Leonid, to whom she had become very attached lately, and immediately stopped laughing, because she realized that the plans were messed up. And she went onto the kitchen, and when the water boiled, Shaul and I woke up from the whistling kettle, and Shaul went onto the kitchen to report on what had happened to Naama. And they're talking, woke Michal, who probably got frightened because for a minute she didn't know where she was. And when she understood, she got another fright because probably it was the last place on earth where she wanted to be. And at first she didn't know whether to get up or whether to pretend she was still sleeping. But before she had time to decide what to do, Mom came into the living room, and she saw that Michal was awake, and she smiled at her and said, Pleased to meet you. 
I'm Alma. And Michal said that she was Michal. And, uh, I'm really sorry for imposing myself on you at 3 o'clock in the morning, but uh, I didn't know where Asaf was, and uh, I didn't want to leave the children alone. And uh, I hope that Nama is fine. And when mom said that Nama is just okay, thanks, Michal added that Shaul had been wonderful, and then she had nothing else to say. And she stood there embarrassed, and after a moment she said, well, I'd better go now. And mom told her, look what's going on outside, because it was pouring rain. And Michal said, never mind, so I'll get a little wet. And mom said, why don't you have a cup of coffee first? And while you are having it, we'll call a cab. And there is no need to feel uncomfortable, because we are used to bizarre situations in our family. <laughs> Actually, this is one of the advantages supplied by us as presents to everybody who lives with him. And Michal smiled and said, I wonder where he is. He simply disappeared. So we all moved to the kitchen to drink coffee and cocoa and, and to eat the pancakes which Leonid prepared. And it was so peaceful and pleasant that Michal forgot to call a cab. In the middle of all this, we had someone trying to open the front door. And mom disappeared in the hall. And we heard dad, something is wrong with the key, Alma. And mom answers, there is nothing wrong. It simply doesn't fit the lock. And then he asked her, half joking, if she was taking defensive action against him. And mom says, well, we'll have to postpone this interesting discussion because there is a more urgent subject, subject on the agenda whose principal participant is waiting for you in the kitchen. <laughs> and then he came into the kitchen and saw Leonid with his apron on, flipping over another pancake, and he examined Michal who was sitting opposite the door, and both Shaul and myself. And he came in a little hesitantly, and mom followed him and introduced Leonid from the answering machine. And dad shook his hand and asked, isn't the apron a little small for you? But when he saw the way mom was looking with, at him, he decided to leave Leonid alone and to look for another victim. And he scanned the arena suspiciously to decide on possible causes of action. And finally, he opened with, whoa, a real summit meeting. And before anyone could react, he turned to Michal and asked her if she could explain to him what was she doing here. And Michal said, you are in no position to demand explanations. You are the one who has to give them. Where were you? We ran all the numbers you have left. Do you know what happened to Nama? And dad said that he understood from the confused messages she, has, she had left him that Nama had an attack. And I'm really sorry. I'm really, really sorry. I really messed up with the kid. But now let's all say goodbye to Alma and Leonid, who must be dying for privacy. And leave. We'll hold the clarifications at your place. And she asked, at my place? And dad got confused. Apparently he was embarrassed to say at our place about Michal's house. So what came out in the end was, well then here? And Michal said, why not? If Alma doesn't mind, of course. And mom said, on the contrary. <laughs> Dad examined the room again, trying to figure out what had been cooking in this kitchen before he arrived, apart from pancakes. And in the end, he turned to Michal and told her that the whole situation of a public commission of inquiry was intolerable, and I'm going down to wait for you in the car. And Michal simply asked permission to use the phone and call a cab. So Dad followed her into the hall and told her, you are making a big mistake. And she answered, on the contrary, I'm correcting the big mistake. And before he had the time to answer, the cat was outside, and then he, he came in, into the kitchen and noticed mom's smile before she managed to hide it. And my cassette had just reached the end. So as I was turning it over, he turned to me and with a mean voice said, You are recording, huh? Tell me, what do you do with all the tapes? No, well, what do you do with them? We must, you must already have more than a thousand cassettes with everything we say, shit, breathe, fuck. Let me finish with this question, because he's my child too, and I want you to understand what is this fucking obsession of recording every single fucking fart that someone makes? Do you have an answer for me? I had no answer for him. So mom answered instead and told him, Go unload your frustrations elsewhere, you pelotudo. What do you want from the child? You leave me because you have found your great love. 
You dump the children on her, run off to screw the wife of the man you've been closest to in the recent months when he's in hospital on dialysis, your daughter almost dies of an asthma attack, and to top there, you dare to come down on your son? What has he ever done to you? He loves you so much, misses you so much, adores you so much. And the only way he can protect himself against the reality you have screwed up for him is to record it. What the hell do you want from him? That face changed at once. And only I could see how much he was suffering. And I thought of mentioning to mom that that doesn't mean to hurt. It simply comes out against the wrong people. But I didn't say a thing. I just stood there and didn't say a thing. A couple of days later, mom heard from Noah that dad had given him, God knows where he got it from, all the money that Noah had paid him before. And Alma, please help me to find him. Because he has left the studio I rented for him and he is not with Michal anymore and believe me, he is not in good shape. I know people. And if I tell you he is not in good shape, I know what I'm talking about. And I hope that you didn't tell him that I know all about his affair with my wife. I can learn to live with it, Alma. And you too, you too should have learned to live with his problems by now. Because you love him and he loves you and that's what's important, believe me. And you can't expect more than that in life. If two people who love one another are lucky enough to meet, it's a miracle. A miracle which you have to cherish. Uh, Alma, let me finish. You should have had the patience to wait for him a little longer. You know, Alma, most people who step into a swamp come out with slime stuck to them. The trick is to come out with the narcissus. And mom didn't say a word because her decision to divorce dad was final. And she didn't want anyone to talk her into thinking that the swamp that dad had made out of her life was really Narcissus. So Noah stood up, kissed her goodbye, and asked her to let him know immediately if she had something from Asi, because he smelled a catastrophe. And after everything he had heard and seen in his life, that was the only sense he still relied on. After a few weeks, mom found dead and took us to visit the sordid apartment he had rented. It was actually one little room with a tiny bathroom and a corner for cooking on the roof of an old crumbling house on Yonahanabi Street. And we all crowded on the couch, which took out a quarter of the room and sat there shyly, examining the big photographs of Treblinka hanging on the walls because Noah had persuaded dad to keep working on his book. And we didn't know what to say or what to do. Dad offered mom coffee, and we all had to stand up because the couch had to be moved in order to open the door of the little cupboard where dad kept the coffee. And lucky it was summer, and we could all go onto the big roof and look at the blue sea. And meanwhile, my tape, which was left in the room, recorded mom and dad. She asked him if he needed any help. Recently, the office was doing well. They had received a number of big projects. She was beginning to breathe easily, and it was no problem for her to lend him a bit of money. And Dad smiled and said that he doesn't need anything. And he thinks that in the meantime, until his situation improves, these visits aren't such a good idea because he cannot contribute anything to the children, so please give him some time. And without looking at her, he asked her if she loved Leonid. And Mom said... Yes. Funny the way things turn out, don't you think? And I hope you're not thinking about being stuck here for years now. It would be a crime. You're so talented. You mustn't waste yourself here on games of musical chairs, moving the couch to move the chair to open the cupboard. It's idiotic, Assi. Idiotic. And from the way she said it's idiotic, Assi, Idiotic. I know for certain that she loved him deeply even then. 
on their last meeting. Shaul and Amma hardly ever visited dead, and I don't blame them. But I went on at least twice a week, especially after Shaul began practicing the Haftarah for his bar mitzvah. Be comforted, be comforted, my people save the Lord, which all of us, including Nama and Leonid, already knew by heart. First, I would go to the bakery on King George Street and buy the burekas, which Dad said were the most delicious in the Middle East. From there, I would walk up Allenby Street. Then I went down Geula Street to Hayakon Street. And when I reached Dad's tiny little apartment, I would find him standing on the roof, looking at his little piece of sea, or sleeping, or staring blankly at the computer. And he would make me hot chocolate from sour milk and come sit next to me on the couch. And from time to time, when our eyes met, he would smile his kind, sad smile at me. And after the sun set, he would say that it's beginning to get late, kiss me goodbye, whisper in my ear that he loves me, and ask me to tell my brother and sister that he loves them too. to celebrate the end of the long vacation, I went to Dad's for the last time. And, then, and when I went into his room, the computer was on with one of Noah's seven souls files on the screen. And the tape was playing Sheila Chandra. And you could hear the neighbor's radio broadcasting the evening news. And since Dad wasn't in the room or in the bathroom, I went out to the roof. And I saw him standing there, a little way ahead of me, with his face to the sea and his back to me, and I didn't want to disturb him, so I stayed standing where I was, trying to see the things he was seeing. After a few minutes, a breeze began to blow, and I saw the dead was swaying slightly, and I realized immediately that the beam separating us from each other was hiding the rope on which he had hung himself. And I went up to him and remembered the thoughts I once had about the connection between air and time and thought about another connection. Now that he doesn't have a drop of air left, he has all the time in the world. And I touched him. And from the warmth of his body, I realized that it had happened only a short time before I arrived. But the time that had passed, that time, <laughs> 